Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Julia Rodriguez Garcia and I'm an associate professor in the um, Department of Food and Nutritional Science at Reading University. So today's talk is about um, potential novel ingredients that could be very um, beneficial in the bakery sector. So this is the structure of the talk today. I'm going to briefly introduce um, where I work, what I do and give a bit of an overview on how this novel ingredient fits um, around the whole of the food system. And then I'm going to discuss different research projects that we are undertaking to develop these um, new ingredients. So the main um, objective of the research that is undertaken at the Food and Nutritional Science Department is um, to improve the quality of food and nutrition and just to improve uh, people's life and the health of the society and global sustainability. Um, so we are uniquely placed to study what influences the food choices and that we make as consumers and how um, the nutrition they provide impacts on cardiovascular, um, metabolic and neurodegenerative disorders. Um, we also are interested in the impact of food production um, in the world through areas such as sustainable processing, uh, reduction of food waste and processing bioproducts. We also work in the development of novel ingredients and um, product reformulation to improve the nutritional and sustainable profile of these products. We always um, take into consideration work with consumers from co-creation work to the study of their acceptability and continuous purchase intention. Specifically, my um, group focus in the food reformulation and ingredient functionality research area. So we've been working a lot on sugar reduction and saturated fat reduction in biscuits, cereal bars and cupcakes. Um, and we are currently working more in focus in fiber increase and the introduction on novel protein sources in bread as the best um, vehicle to improve the dietary intake of fiber um, and, and a whole amino acid profile in, um, in the diet. Um, we perform this research um, through evaluating the physical properties of the ingredients and the food matrix and the formation of the structure through the processing steps and we finally evaluate the perception of these products by consumers. So as I've mentioned, our main goal is to promote and enable the adoption of healthy diets, um, which are sustainable, affordable and palatable. Um, but in order to achieve this, um, we need to take into consideration um, the whole food system. And this slide kind of um, explains how complex it is. And in food science and technology, one is dealing with a wide variety of players and transformative steps. So from, from the primary production of products to the um, delivery, transport, storage and different steps of transformation um, to the consumption and digestion of, of these nutrients, but also to continue um, to continue changes in regulations and policies and, and safety measures. So it's kind of a complex ecosystem in the one um, we work and it's something to consider. So is this global um, food system um, that I've just mentioned is the second biggest contribution, contribution to climate change after energy the, after the energy industry. Um, so our eating habits are destroying the environment and we all know about, you know, these growing problems on biodiversity loss, deforestation, drought, um, freshwater pollution um, or collapse of the aquatic wildlife. And this in turn is threatening our food supply and, and does the food security in, in our food system. But it is not just the impact of our heating habits in the ecosystem, it's also about the impact in our health. Um, so 80% of the processed foods that is sold in the UK is unhealthy. And 
these products are high in salt, refined um, carbohydrates, high in sugar, fats, and low in fiber, they are three times cheaper than healthier foods. And this makes really difficult the adoption of these healthier diets by our population. So there is this growing recognition um, about the need to change our national diet as a matter of urgency from everyone, from the government to industry, as well as the public. So government um, legislation has come into force um, to ensure um, a level playing field. So food producers are working um, in, product, in producing healthier food products, but also farmers will be rewarded um, for managing their land more sustainable and working towards restoring biodiversity. Um, the government has made a legal commitment to reduce UK carbon emissions and the farming sector itself will have to become carbon neutral, which is um, quite challenging, these, these kind of objectives. But all of these objectives are to produce more food um, from the remaining land without going back into the... Um, um, intense farming practices that have already done so much damage. So we need to produce um, a steady supply of affordable and safety foods. So we must unleash the potential of soilless farming. Um, we need to develop a new and more sustainable protein sources, and we need to tap uh, the plant farming potential of the oceans. And this is um, what I'm going to talk about right now in terms of potential future ingredients that we will be able to apply in our food system and more specifically in bakery products. So the first ingredient um, or group of ingredients that I would like to discuss are pulses and specifically I have selected faba beans because um, I mean pulses in general as we know they are nitrogen fixing um, products, part of the leguminosae family, so they enrich the soil with nitrogen and they reduce the need of fertilizers, of exogenous fertilizers. Um, so they are the most flexible um, pulse, faba beans, um, for a diversity of agronomic solutions because they can be sown as a winter or a spring crop and the carving, they can be harvested um, through a long period of time after maturation. Um, faba beans also have a really great nutritional composition. They have the highest protein yield potential of all UK crops. We can't produce faba beans that could be around 28% um, protein. And they are also rich in soluble fiber, um, folate and specific micronutrients such as iron and zinc. When we compare them with the staple cereals, they really are more beneficial, nutritionally speaking. Um, research uh, on the nutritional side of faba bean and pulses consumption have shown that Continuous consumption of these kind of products lower the risk of cardiovascular diseases, lower blood cholesterol, improves glycemia and blood pressure, and can also bring some benefit in iron deficiency anemia. So, um, it, this kind of ingredients bring both the sustainable and the nutritious angle into our diets. Um, some research that is undertaken and should be undertaken in the near future in order to enable um, these ingredients to become part of our food system should be around the productivity in terms of yields of faba beans and how to incorporate them into current agriculture processes. Um, also selection of varieties um, with the best quality in terms of composition and viability of micronutrients. We need to consider that these products also contain um, some anti-nutrients that makes more difficult the availability of certain, um, like the iron, for example. So it's to investigate how to promote the growing of varieties that are better placed in terms of protein, quality, fiber components, and also macronutrient viability. Research should also focus in the processing side. So um, 
pre-treatment such as drying, deholing, milling, and how to incorporate this in the food system in terms of as an ingredient, as a flower, but also um, as a new bean in, in the consumer's diet. Um, the four is really, really important also to, to consider consumer perspective, how they will accept these ingredients in their daily diets and what are the mechanisms to better introduce them. Um, the second um, ingredient I would like to discuss is grass and clover, so forage products in general. Um, in terms of land use, 77% um, of the land um, is used to raise livestock for meat and dairy production. Um, from this land use, we are able to produce 17 calories and 33% of proteins for human consumption. And then the other 23% um, of the land is used for growing crops for human consumption. And from this portion of the land, um, we produce 83 calories and 67% protein. So in terms of energetic uh, sustainability, growing plants for direct human consumption is a more efficient use of the land. So um, local sources of plants um, that are are underutilized in our planet. So only 20% of the plant species are making up 90% of the world grown crops. And we all know them, which are the main ones, are wheat, rice, and maize. Um, so although they are now, we are now focusing on the grass and, and clover's potential, um, although they are very, they have a very high calorific value, they are not adequate for direct human consumption because they're really, really high in undigestible fibers such as cellulose. And that's why up to now they've been mainly used for animal feed, such as fertilizers and for biogas production. But they also have a, a very great potential because they have a very good um, amino acid profile. It's really close to soybean amino acid profile. They also contain a significant amount of minerals like magnesium, potassium, calcium, and nutraceuticals such as fructans and, and a diverse range of polyphenols. So, the research should be again focusing on what varieties of glass and clover we could develop that are really um, high in these proteins and in these other nutraceutical components such as the macronutrients and fructans. Um, a lot of research also um, should focus in the developing of the extraction and concentration methods of both of these um, proteins and nutraceuticals and of a great importance will be the product development work and how we investigate the chemistry behind the removal of certain flavors and colors that we don't want to extract um, uh, through these processes um, and the development of new ones and make products containing proteins and nutraceuticals from grass and clovers really acceptable by consumers. So the next um, kind of ingredient that we envisage are going to produce quite novel applications in the food sector and in the bakery sector are algae, and they refer to a wide range of aquatic group of organisms that reduce carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Um, the, smallest, the smallest types of organisms are unicellular and microscopic, and these are the microalgae. And they've been considered a promising feedstock for um, the food industry because they have a very high aerial productivity compared to other traditional crops, and they don't they don't have any dependence on fresh water or arable land. Um, their composition is also very very interesting. They are also able to produce different biomasses. Um, such as lipids, the biomass lipids from microalgae is really rich in essential polyunsaturated fatty acids with more than 20 carbons. Um, the microalgae also contain essential amino acids and the amino acid profile can be compared to the one of egg and soybean, again, a very complete amino acid profile, and they can also produce carbohydrates. 
in terms of the research that can go towards the development of products um, from microalgae, um, there is some work that needs to be focused on technologies to the, for the scale up of the production of the microalgae and their biomass. Um, so that's the main challenge nowadays. So how to improve the current cultivation methods to scale it up. Um, also how to grow the microalgae. So we promote the production of certain metabolites, certain lipids or certain proteins or certain amino acids um, among others. Um, and also in order to make um, the microalgae a profitable market and potential application in the food industry in the next decade or so, um, a lot of research needs to put in to make um, a more cost effective harvest and processing methods. The fungi also bring a lot of uh, potential for the food industry. There are different kind of ventures that are on their infancy, but are defined by their attempt to produce structures and materials that are um, acceptable by consumers. So microprotein, microprotein generally performs better than animal derived proteins across impact categories like the global warming potential, uh, land use efficiency or energy use. Um, they also have a very complete amino acid profile and they have other nutritional benefits. Um, the development of food products with micro, um, uh, microproteins or fungi, um, they bring a lot of benefits in terms of the development of textures and flavors, depending on the selection of the um, species and the media in which they are growing. So it's a very versatile and have a lot of potential. So the research um, focusing in this area of fungi and microprote microproteins is mainly focusing on the efficiency of protein uh, production through microproteins. So we can get products from 60 to 90 percent protein concentration on a dry basis. Um, also, as I've mentioned before, um, the potential to develop um, different textures through filamentous um, fungi and also through um, different morphologies, the addition of certain chemicals of other proteins, um, cultivation processes and post-cultivation such as extrusion or drying processes. Um, and a very interesting area um, under research in this um, fungi kind of world is about the flavor development, um, because through the choice of the microorganism and the media, we can really control what type of flavor components are developed in the final food products. So these were the main ingredients I wanted to introduce in today's presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you.